Welcome to the May 15th Open ZFS Production User Call. We have Andrew, Rod, Stu, Alexander, Daniel, Jan, and myself, Michael. And hey, everyone, BSD CAN is right around the corner. There is still time to register and attend. I think Alexander, Daniel, and myself will be there. I sure hope others can. And let's see, Rod, you were talking in the pre-show about the fact that you can, in fact, have a, a ZFS file system driver that's a native EFI payload. Do you have a link to that for what it's worth? Um, no. Okay, cool. And you're <laughs> pointing out that one could build a kernel as an EFI image. Do you have a sense if that's only Linux, or have you seen that in FreeBSD and Lumos and others? Uh, so far that I know of, Linux has support for it. There should not be, I mean... There should not be a reason that we don't. I, I believe the FreeBSD kernel is, in fact, built as a, when is it built as? It's built as an ELF image. Um, uh, the loader is a PE executable uh, when contained in an EFI partition. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I believe we have the tool chain stuff in place, but we just don't have the makefile goo to... to to build a kernel that way. It should not be difficult. So, but if I understand correctly right now, FreeBSD boots by first, okay, UEFI reads the, one of UEFI booting system reads the part 32 partition, finds the PE bootloader, reads its configuration and the partition table again, and then loads the kernel or the next bootloader stage from uh, the zpool. Hmm. Normally yeah. you put in a second stage bootloader instead of directly loading the kernel because otherwise you lose a bunch of features. Yeah, we load our EFI loader actually loads loader from ZFS. Which then has a ZFS uh, more fully featured ZFS implementation and can read in kernel modules, preload them. I believe so. both of those have used the same standalone EF, uh, ZFS code. Bootex, Bootex 64 and the loader share, they're all built out of the same directory and they share the same standalone ZFS library. So it's not like the classic grub, which was always far behind and its own set. Right. Of yeah, yeah. It's not, we don't. FreeBSD yeah. doesn't have that problem because we link our EFI loader module with the same thing that we link the loader with, and it's 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 the. I actually think it pulls the ZFS code in from the latest version of ZFS that we have in there. That's. That's the reason that when we add ZFS, when we upgrade our Z, FreeBSD ZFS, which adds new features to it, it doesn't fuck up our boot code because we're already we're we're using that version of ZFS. If you update your yeah. boot code, but yes, yeah, yeah, I, you, that happened to me the first <laughs> time I tried a native ZFS encryption. Everything worked until I rebooted, and then the pool was uh, unreadable. That but is a rite of passage. Go ahead. Uh, at least I uh, did it in a, a VM instead of one real hardware bot. Good. Uh, Alexander, your time is precious. Do you have any news to share from the development perspective? Uh, good question. Uh, last week I spent in hell. I was oh, trying dear. to investigate uh, problems with uh, TrueNAS scale on with ZFS, Linux, and uh, problem with swapping on new Topic. six. Okay. Seven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like it's it's really a hell. Uh, from one side, ZFS lies what can, what it can do. From other side, kernel asks absolutely insane things like drop quarter of your arc, please. I need a few kilobytes of memory. And uh, it's they seem like never worked fine before, but these days, after at least six six LTS kernel end up, uh, they introduce a new multi-gen LRU code, which just tries to do our do all the evictions in one go. So. <laughs> 
at, uh, at first it tries to swap everything it can, then it tries to drop, push the same, put the same pressure on arc, again, dropping half of it as I have told. So uh, it doesn't work in any way possible. So I just complain it to the author of that patch. He confirmed that there is definitely dragons. Promise to take a look, but it doesn't tell what to do with ZFS after that. Because we already have plenty of kernels which are insane. And if we try to behave normally, then we suffer. If we don't behave, then we also suffer. <laughs> damned if you do, and, damned if you don't. Okay. Yeah, and it's pretty ugly. I hope to discuss it next week on a developer call. Uh, maybe somebody has good ideas, but I really doubt about it. It's probably a painful area for a long time. It never been working right. And, and done some work is that applied to all ZFS on Linux systems? And just it hasn't been a, given much attention? Uh, no, in I think in our case it went uh, it went, in case of Trunas we upgraded at the same time uh, to kernel kernel six six because previous kernel six five uh, six one LTS uh, had that code disabled so it didn't affect uh -huh. users. Six six LTS enabled it. I haven't looked where exactly it got enabled. Maybe somewhere in between. I don't know. But uh, it, now it's enabled, uh, and now also in in uh, ZFS 2.3, no, in master, uh, maximum size of arc increased from 50% of memory to almost 100, it's like all, all memory minus one gig. And that, really? uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that triggers a problem. So in, uh, in Trunas uh, scale Dragonfish, while we still run ZFS 2.2.4, we bumped arc size, to the maximum to be ahead of train somewhat, and we hit it. <laughs> I guess some as guess other users have some time window before it hits them, but it may. But the problem is that reducing arc size only postpones the problem until something else uses maybe enough of that other memory. Maybe then it will be not as hard, but again, it's not really great to use half memory. Ah, uh, Stu, you are on Linux. Have you encountered that in your bleeding edge work in the lab? I have not, but that's six out five is where we're sitting right now. So, yeah, there is there were some different. <laughs> well, my lab system is six five. There are some things that I've noticed between the six two, six threes and six five that I'm not happy with. Um, so I haven't gone any deeper than that. Yeah, and, and again, uh, working wise. Arc max by default increases only in ZFS 2.3 in master branch. So unless somebody set it manually, it may be okay. And again, it's okay if you don't have a swap. It's also okay if you don't have much user space to care about if it's only ZFS in vacuum. <laughs> But yeah, there, there are definitely dragons. It has been a painful week to fight those. Understood. It's... Sounds like that's been keeping you busy. Anything else to share? And will you indeed be in Ottawa? Oh, no, I, yeah, I, I'm going to be in Ottawa. I awesome. would uh, stay in there. just need to decide which way I'm going to drive. OK, cool. So, it's places in between, between Tennessee and Ottawa still not decided, but cool. it will be last moment probably. Understood. Just there. Uh, what else? I was trying to look on some performance artifacts uh, when uh, reaching high bandwidth. It also didn't let me to much success. I see that you got assigned that bug that I found in the make FS is that are you making any progress there will that make it into 14 if we're lucky 14 one or uh, is it an odd I, cre I created PR upstream to fix that issue from oh. ZFS side I, I I honestly I forgot was it what's it what's its current state uh, but yeah, at least the is... review ends with just saying hey it's like uh marks feedback but no actual update there so 
Um, that's well, great there news. A, there, there should be a link to the uh, PR, I think. Okay. And uh, if you click, you, we, we see what's the state of the PR. I, honestly, I don't remember. <laughs> no <laughs> worries. Many things. Hey, of course. Uh, uh, so th- it should. Oh, here we go. Pro- that's yeah. new. Yes. Thank you. It should fix the problem from ZFS side. I actually merge it, so it need to be backported. Uh, but uh, as Mark uh, mentioned there uh, on FreeBSD PR, it also has to be ideally fixed from MakeFS side. MakeFS just doesn't create structures that's supposed to be there for ah. this version of ZFS. Yeah, ZFS forgives it, but it's not right. Got it. Cool. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, chime in with anything you've got. Um, oh, and years ago, I think uh, Mohammed with Seagate was going to send some multi-actuator drives to you. Did that ever happen? Because it sounds like uh, Stu has some. Well, I have a couple from many years ago from when Seagate presented those on, mm-hmm. uh, on some dev summit. I don't remember, four or five years ago, quite yep, a while. Sounds right. I have, yeah, I, I have those, and uh, those are dual LAN uh, drives. Yeah. They kind of they are doing what they, they are supposed to do, and they are not really have much interest to for the file system developers sciences. Uh, they are. But they, like there is it. there is definitely some need for the Z pool scientists though. <laughs> Z pool what? So, you know, abstracting the Z pool management from, from the file system itself, there are some things I came up or that I noticed and now I've got some wider concerns on that. So I'm going to paste this in real quick. Oh, please. Yes. So yeah, to Alexander, to catch you and everyone up, uh, Stu has been waiting on some new dual actuator drives that sound like they arrived last okay. week. And you've yeah, been so I, poking I, at them. Go ahead. Yeah, I've got eight of them. Oh, nice. Um, so are they see. still dual LAN or are they hide they're it still, behind the firmware? They're still dual LAN. Um, here is so there's where how it shows up to the Linux OS. So you'll see that mm-hmm. the, that bit is the significance. Oh, so. yeah. well, from oh, that side, from point of ZFS, they should just work. The, only, the question oh. that appears is what to do about management. How right. To do so, spare handling and so on. Right. And it's the spare handling that is the, the biggest piece. So, again, to alleviate the potential of, hey, I've uh, got in each VDEV, I need to map a, if I have them mapped to the zero versus one, you know, side of, you know, air quote side of the disk. Um, if I move, if I have finished. the spares assigned, how do I ensure that, hey, my spare zero goes to my zero side and my one goes to the one side. And then how do I, automatically remove the opposite one from the spare pool so I don't introduce a single point of failure in a physical drive. So yeah, you're yeah, worried that's... about ZFS using the other LUN on the same disk as a replacement or putting too many LUNs, whereby too many potential single points of failure into one uh, VDEF? Oh, yeah, you should not try to mirror different uh, LANs of same drive. You don't want to put them <laughs> no. the same rate Z. In case of in case one of LANs fail, you should better activate spare for the other one too and replace it automatically. There are plenty of good uh, questions to what to do. The only question how to do that and uh, and yeah. and whether and whether that needs to be done in you know, in this spare logic that, hey, there's a mapping that says these two are tagged to this, this VDEV, you know, going, you know, whether that makes any sense at all from a development standpoint, or is it just another operations wrapper that, hey, I need to activate a spare. 
I'm in a dual actuator mode. Now I need to do these other three steps as part of that. What, so if you have a combination where there's a good solution, you may be able to just sidestep the issue by laying out your pool so that the uh, spares are never um, on the same LAN. Mm -hmm. um, so I saw the same disk or the other right. potential replacements. But yeah, if you have LANs on the same disk, they're both a spare, let's say you have a uh, then you have to be careful that you're not pulling that in. Uh, the default code will just pull a random spare thing, so uh, you would have to make ZFS not auto use the spare, and then instead would have to have some kind of user space uh, help or yeah. handle that. Have the replace uh, another problem I act as act is, as spare. Another problem I foresee is. Um, dealing with uh, D-Rate, where you kind of have to lay out the pool exactly so that none of the lumps uh, match up. Uh, that's probably a math you don't want users to do. In, in D-Rate, you would practically need to create two D-Rates, uh, no, separate yes. D-Rates for each one, otherwise it won't work. Exactly. Uh, and that, and then we, and then in my other testing, that gets into performance impact. Or, or <laughs> another way to do it, if ZFS knew about it, would be to uh, put them basically on the block device level in a um, stripe, uh, and then use them like that. Or if you concatenate them, you would lose the IOPS because this uh, IO scheduler would basically consider the, if you put a block level rate underneath ZFS to recombine the two halves, you would kind of either have to use, go with concatenation or a, a stripe and a, a stripe may just work out, but concatenating would lose the uh, extra IOPS because ZFS doesn't try to use that many active uh, location groups distributed mm -hmm basically worst case from a performance point of view because they would be maximum distance by LDAs. So by expected seek time. Wouldn't it, wouldn't um, it Rodney, would it, go ahead. Would it, would it fundamentally solve the problem if at the very base layer, you just created stripes, non-redundant stripes out of every zero and one LUN of a physical device. That way, if either half of that LUN fails, that, that stripe has failed, and you're going to go up a layer for your redundancy. Mm -hmm. So that, that way, if, you know, it kind of, all the other tools, I think, would just work as they are without any issue. Yep. That should allow you to make reasonable use of the uh, additional IOPS and have the right failure model and recombine the two LUNs into one uh, drive for ZFS to uh, manage. Well, most of the IOPS. Uh, if you had ZFS understanding that there are two physical devices, but they're actually uh, two logical devices, but they're one physical device. And for performance characteristics, basically it should have two IO queues for that drive. Uh, yeah, that would probably be even better, but uh, it would basically push all of that complexity into ZFS. So I would just try to use something like G-Stripe or on Linux, whatever they recommend this week. Well, the, the the other the other thing I tried, as I'm evil, is I created two pools: one that was zero, one that was one, cool. and, and ran testing against both of them at the same time. Oh, it's and it was fugly. Okay. Interesting. Did it kind of ping pong <laughs> as if they're bottlenecked on their interfaces or they something? They were. They were. You would. My guess is it was interface bottleneck because they were coming. Yeah. And wow. I mean, the same test that I was doing with, you know, just half of half of the pool took 
three minutes and 49 seconds. These doable doing it, actual doing, it, doing the same test, doing the same tests against both of them. I had six minutes, six twenty, and five minutes and thirty three seconds. So, right, so basically, it was IO bound somewhere. Nearly twice the same twice the time to do it on. So there were basically no performance gains. It is a, almost as if you did ran the test twice uh, in succession on the same drive. Are are these dual actuator drives single? Single what, Rodney? You cut out there. I, I'm asking if these are, the, are. First off, are they SAS drives? Yes. Okay, and are they dual ported? No. Oh, interesting. Is that a uh, sample? Is, sample six like gigabit or SAS twelve? No. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, Alexander, sorry. Samples I had from years ago also was SAS, also were single ported. Plus, they were samples and had a separate piece of paper saying that uh, due to some firmware uh, artifacts, uh, they cache is balanced between the two lands, and there could be some artifacts there without much explanation. But honestly, mm. I wouldn't expect it to be as slow as you described. I would really expect dual. Uh, double C, double number of IOPS from drives uh, in that situation. I wonder, can it be artifacts yeah. of two pools, maybe somehow or something? Across, would... across two V devs, so the full map, the, the across two V devs, it was two minutes and eight seconds. Across a single six V dev, it was 349. Six V dev? Eight times? Spindles. Let him finish. Go ahead, Stu, and then we'll ask. Oh so, yeah, so so two by six, it was two oh eight. One by six, it was three forty nine. And then running them one by six and one by six, dual testing, you know, concurrent testing, it was six minutes twenty one and five minutes thirty three, for the exact same test. Hmm. I, like, what are your tests? Are they more sequential bio, or random? Bio, file, bio uh, random read write at 75%. Well, a write could be uh, in ZFS, should be pretty much sequential, while a read would be interesting. The, could, uh, have you tried to run synthetics on, on uh, one of a drive? How much does it scale? I would expect you should get double performance from. Two lands running at the same time. Is, is that what I remember myself seeing? Um, that's a whole, and that's it, a whole point. Yeah, in a single deep, in a single pool, I did get that. I mean, it was like 78, 82 percent type of range from in that in that first mode. So it was faster than running against it, you know, just half of the drive. Uh, two questions. Do you have to give these back soon? And also, what metrics of uniqueness do you have? I see you had like these IDs here with the zero and the one. Do you have like two serial numbers or it's one serial number and that's ambiguous or that, when are they distinguished? When are they ambiguous? Yeah, that's the that's the worldwide number. They've got uh, individual UUIDs as well. Okay. Um, I didn't actually run my hardware scan against it. This should do that. Those, those should not be parsable generally. Those are just uh, a, pack, a pack strings mostly, aside of when they're encoded there. But I think uh, all identification we, we have is a LAN number, LAN ID, that is zero and one. And we see, okay, those two LANs are part of one device, and we should try to stay away from them. The question whether, like how it goes through the stack layers, uh, block layer. Was it visible to, for the FS in anyhow? But uh, Eric, uh, just re returning back yeah, to hey, the perf performance question. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, in the path they have they come out as fizz drive number LUN zero or LUN one. So the OS thinks that they're 
you have syntax you can drop in the doc because that's fascinating to get people ready for this. Um, I guess it, I guess it may be a, a lot of or, or a specific. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean. I mean, copy possibly this. smart. I mean, uh, I don't know. if they are a single bit apart uh, in some of the identifiers, would it make sense to teach ZFS to pull in these identifiers and then basically but what, you may get... look for replacements with the maximum hemming distance to the one with trailed or something? You may get two devices in one batch, just sequential. <laughs> it doesn't give any guarantees. As no, one is uh, probably if, the only identification. And even then, you don't want to uh, use, uh, if you have two drives with sequential sequence numbers, first of all, this is probably not a gray code they're using as a counter. So it's probably a multi-bit uh, difference if there's any carry. And you still don't want to use two drives with sequential sequence numbers as the failed yeah. drive and its replacement, if you can pick a drive with a bigger hemming distance in its IDE, because it's less likely to just be from the same manufacturing line at the same time with identical tolerances and identical okay. load and history, so that it will fail statistically significantly more likely close together. Fair enough. Um, so you, you can clean that up how you want, Michael. I just pasted that below. Down it. below. Cool. And Thank if you. there's a single bit oh, uh, yes. difference <laughs> between uh, pairs of drives, uh, and ZFS already oh. is able to pull this ID in, or is the only way you see it if you access it through this path slash def this by WWN or whatever. No, hmm. the WN is, is a magic. A LAN number is reliable, actually, more or less. Like it's reliable identification. The only question yeah, how convenient to get it. The WWN is supposed to be an opaque yeah. blob. And yes, for some types you can infer that there's a UI forty eight embedded or something. On, I think oh, as there, there are standards on, on them for the part where with vendor ID where is sub vendor where is within vendor, but that's yeah. all that's there. And as a type, so it's supposed to tell you how it's supposed yeah. to be yeah, basically right. partitioned into bit fields, but you really shouldn't have to look into that. Does anyone have tests they would like Stu to run if he's available to run them? Uh, Stu, if you can, I would like to see different stripe widths, uh, especially bigger stripe widths like a megabyte or so to stripe length to just run across those and see if it gets you a bump, especially in IOPS or if you only get the sequential throughput then. The other thing would be to, I would like to see is uh, the utilization of the per drive ports so that uh, you can find out if it's really bottlenecked by the 6 or 12 gigabit SAS port because I can't see a spinning drive saturated 12 gig port other than just in short bursts from its uh, cache. Um, Jan, was that your question in chat? Perhaps was an expander involved? I didn't understand. Yeah, exactly. Crazy. Because okay. uh, was there any active backplane with a SAS expander? And could it be that you oversubscribed its bandwidth and that you have too uh, few lanes going through to the expander and your whole drive collection behind the expander is just, for example, bottlenecked by going through uh, four lanes for. Okay, ten, well, ten or sixty drives because Stu, are those direct wired? Yeah, those are all direct wired. In. Great, thank you. And do you happen to know if you have a reasonably uh, performant HPA and not some? I trust he has some it, of the it, finest. This this is our this is our standard build, and the performance on a on twelve di twelve normal SAS drives. Is within about ten percent of the 
the first test. So, so that's you to know, are those 12 gigabit test drives or six gigabit? 12. Okay. Okay. So you should uh, have enough bandwidth. One would hope. Anything else related to that kind of awesome science that is pretty much breaking news? Um, are you in a, in a position to just write down your methodology and the results for anyone who comes back later to reproduce I, I it? Have, yeah, I haven't, I haven't done the formal stuff. That was my first pass. Um, I'm going to be doing the formal test plan and all that kind of crap next week. Oh, can you reproduce was, a shell script or something? Yeah, this is my this is my first. Hey, let's see. We got them in. They're installed. They're visible. Nice. What, what can I see in you know half an hour worth of work versus you know six days? A smoke test. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that. You're doing Rod's work. Let's see. Uh, Daniel, if we keep it quick, uh, you and I had touched on ZFS Allow, which I consider an amazing feature. It's like transparent pseudo where you just suddenly a user can do stuff that normally is root. But you notice that perhaps on ZVols, it's pretty limited if you're in a position to talk. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's two There's two things about ZFS Allow that you I can could... describe the um, issue. Yeah, so yeah, so ZVol, ZVols are always leaves. So that means that for replication purposes, you can't you can't grant a backup user the the right to uh, replicate permissions to new ZVols by by default, which which is sort of the more general problem. ZFS allow uh, provides um, you know deals with permissions for three separate things: subcommands, properties, and then other. With other being um, you know stuff like the ability to set or or um, or even read um, various uh, uh, um, shoot what do you call it like um, reservations and stuff. Okay. So so basically, so ZFS allow does all three of those things, but but I feel like I feel like they're missing a big a big point, which is which is a backup user, somebody who has the ability to deal with properties, but has limitations on which, um, uh, on, on which uh, subcommands they use, right? Like you want some, like you want a backup user to be able to retrieve, not destroy and not send. Like, why would you want your backup user to be able to, to, to resend your stuff elsewhere? You might, you might not want to do that. Um, but, wouldn't you want them to be able to get and replicate all of the, you know, all of the properties? So, so it's pretty tricky in that ZFS allow is always opt in. You can't say uh, opt in to all properties, but opt out of of these three destructive commands. Like if you could do that, it would be, I think, a hundred percent sweeter. Does that does that make sense? Did I summarize that well enough? And that's unique to Zvol's not data sets, right? Well, it's unique to it's unique to everything. The problem is with 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 data sets, at least you can have a top level data set where you yeah. ZFS allow every single property under the sun. And then anything new they replicate in, they'll inherit that ZFS allow per permission. But you can't do that with Zvols because you know, like I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't know that you would necessarily need to need to do something like like this. But like, like vol mode or something like that. Like, what if you wanted your backup user to be able to replicate the vol mode permission, which does make sense. I mean, some some Z vols I use to you know to mount an ext permission uh, partition or something, and then some other ones I use as VMs. So I want the Z the the vol mode to be dev. So not having that, you know, not not being able to inherit uh, ZFS allow permissions to, to volumes seems like a limitation. Of course, I just know what I've read in the documentation and what I've experimented with, so I could be totally wrong about this. But it seems like there should be 
that CFS allow is really, really designed for, uh, you know, for jails and other, for, for like users and jails and stuff like that, that are, that are sharing a piece of uh, a server. Um, but ZFS allow isn't really designed for, uh, for various types of backup and, and migration and, and redundancy operators, operator accounts, which is, which is a hundred percent how I use them. A uh, naive question. Is there any notion of inheritance in Zvols or is it just not a notion? Zvols are always leaves. So it's okay, impossible to inherit. Yeah. So, so Zvols are going to inherit anything they can inherit, but obviously they can't inherit mount point because they right. don't have a mount point, right. et cetera. But, but you can't do the other way around. You can't say, Hey, this top level data set, I want all of my replicated in Zvols to be yeah, so this isn't even this isn't even limited to ZFS allow. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to replicate in all of my new Z vaults should have, um, you know, should be vol uh, vol mode equals whatever. But you know, th there are tunables for that sort of thing now. But it would be you know just just to keep in line with ZFS's inherit everything uh, structure. This. You know, there, there's there's a couple of clunky things here for uh, for both ZFS allow and and uh, Zvols with or without ZFS allow. Has anyone else encountered that when backing up, replicating, sending Zvols? And of course, of course, when you're replicating, like mm -hmm. things like. Um, you know, like, uh, like block size and stuff like that. Those are, you know, I mean, I think those are just sort of gimmies. So I, I've never had a, a problem with those. And, and I honestly, I can't, I guess I can't think of a ton of properties. Actually, Jan, you might have some off the top of your head. What are there properties that I might want to inherit for a Z vol that would be impossible to inherit? Or is vol mode really uh, the well, only the, one that I'm vol concerned about? Vol mode used to be a problem because, uh, the device, the block slash character device created for the Z vol to access its content and its vol mode, especially on FreeBSD, was only updated on create or in pool import. Uh, but I think in 13 that has been fixed so that you can, so, so that you don't have to export and re-import the pool to, uh, once you changed vol mode to get rid of, for example, uh, the GM provider attaching to uh, your virtual machine's uh, partitioning table and then refusing the guest to repartition its data drive because because it's, no, no, that partition table is uh, tasted by the host and the host refuses you to uh, wipe your uh, guest partition table, this kind of crap. <laughs> or the host yelling at you that open BSD, BSD labels are different from previous BSD labels and have too many petitions hmm. and you don't want it, the host to taste it. Yeah. So there's like that, snap you're on a Linux distribution, which is desktop for because like Ubuntu may be auto mounted it because someone clicked in around in slash media. Uh, Maybe yeah. SnapDev and Zvol mode are the only two that exist, and that's the reason why there wasn't a lot of thought put into this. Um, um, so I think those might be the, the only caching two properties, properties are also uh, something you want to set up, but that's basically a, well, you set it once and then touch it. Yeah, you could. Uh, yeah, but you could set those. You could you could set those in a file system, and they'd be inherited by the Zvol, so that's okay. Yes, but depending on what you use the file system for, you want it to have a different uh, caching value than the Zvols. Maybe you want full caching, but you want primary cache equals metadata on your Zvol if you're using it for a hypervisor. Hmm. But maybe if you don't want performance uh, for data operations to be terrible on the parent uh, file system, then you kind of want it to have primary cache uh, to be the default value. And yeah, then uh, if you have an unmount, so that basically forces you to have an unmountable, as in can mount equals off parent 
just so that you can use it to inherit from values which you don't want uh, because they would be very suboptimal on a, a mounted file system, for example, primary cache equals metadata. Hmm. If you don't care because all the file system contains is a, let's say one config file, which is only read when you restart a virtual machine and having to read it from disk isn't that bad because it's one disk access among so many when you reboot the virtual machine. Okay. Hmm. Uh, Daniel, did you say snap dev or snap dev? Yeah. Um, snap dev for volumes. Yeah. What is that? If you... That's you can see different volumes in like a snap deer, really? Yep. Oh, so I that you that. can uh, access the snapshots. Nice. Interesting. Um, the yeah. other problem I can think of would be if you have uh, thinly provisioning it, the quota and reservation. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, but, uh, if you're any, if you're want to play it safe, you just have a reservation equal to the size so that you will never get a device full error on the um, block device. That's a different volume. issue, Michael. That's not okay. that's not related to this. Okay, one. cool. We can, uh, we can skip topic. that and talk to somebody else. <laughs> but other than uh, that, I can't think of anything I have messed around on the vault. Alexander, does the this ring a bell? Uh, the volume uh, block size are create time options. Yeah, those seem to replicate no matter who's replicating them. Yeah, because you have to, because they're creating yeah, you have options. To. Okay, so uh, Alexander, as a developer, does any of that ring support? a bell uh, on issues? Yeah, the Z ball right. support, the character device supports uh, whatever API the host operating system has for doing, for doing unmapping and Scuffy terminology, trim, and data. Uh, Going down the uh, rabbit. Yeah. Okay. No, I haven't looked. Uh, I haven't listened very close, but I don't remember ZFS. Uh, ZFS having any special limitation for properties inheritance for the walls. It, in some cases, it made intentionally like difference between uh, wall block size versus record size. Those yep. are made intentionally separate. And there are a few other cases like that, just because they are expected to be different from parent the walls. Yes. But, but honestly, the walls should should be able to inherit anything. They yes. are same point of code. It's just some properties can be marked either only as data set or only the wall or potentially both. Maybe but some of those which are only meaningful to a Z wall can still be set on a file system so that you can inherit them from the file you system. You can really. Yeah, yep. no, it, it, it's 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 specified in code. Some properties can be, some many are not. Interesting. But it's only a decision of a code designer. Like, so that it's... still that still means that a ZFS allow user replicating in the new ZVOL, but it, it's impossible to grant that user a um, a snap dev or or vol mode property at least because it's impossible to put it. You know, but you can't you can't set it until the uh, the Z vol exists. So it'd be impossible to replicate it with the correct permissions hmm. from hmm. Uh, from one box Poten to another. But potentially we could allow vol mode to be set for data sets, and that way you could set it globally on receiving side. Uh, on free would... vol mode has a hack. You can set it through CCTL on yeah, receiving that's side. Right. That's other way. But yeah, that's bit... what I do now. Yep. On the backup system, if it's a dedicated backup system, just set the default vol mode to just the character device. For sure. So that you That's can and read it and expose the um, snap devices because they are harmless as in their read only anyway. And if you don't taste them for partitions or file systems, they don't. So, can't be used as an attack vector against the uh, backup system by putting corrupt file system on them or something. Okay. Uh, Mark's got a question. Can we shift to that? Oh, ready when you are. Let her rip. So 
is, I mean, I, I, most of you guys can read here, but uh, for you who's not looking, reading along, um, I've been running into some issues on some uh, Beehive machines lately for Windows 2022 specifically. But uh, for some MSSQL servers, we found that uh, disabling Windows optimization has decreased the amount of memory usage and CPU usage quite quite a bit, from about 56 gigabytes out of 64 gigs to 20 gigs. Does anybody know if it's generally a good idea to run disk defragmenter processes on Windows VMs running on top of a ZFS ZVOL? I know that kind of straddles the Beehive meeting tomorrow, but it's also on running on ZFS. All valid. So. Yes, no, it's all good. Um, there was a recent comment from the last call or two. So let me see if that's visible. But it was, hey, should we indeed use the Windows optimization? I forget the exact term. But anyway, if you do a quick poke through there, you might see that. Um, but yes, that said, uh, does it, someone have an answer to that? I, I would think it would depend if it was thin provisioned or thick provisioned to begin with, but I may be wrong. Most of ours are thin, thin provisioned. And I did go on further down. I had a, uh, I looked up a little bit further and someone said that uh, it's thin provisioned, that simply just, just defragmenting would simply just move the bits around, causing ZFS to just do more work that it doesn't need to do, is the mm -hmm. way that I read read it. That's my That's my instinct. It would also give it a chance to do a better job at compressing them and to reallocate the blocks uh, physically close together on the disks. Interesting. But uh, yeah, you're just churning through your storage at that point. So for hurting an IOPS, then we probably should disable it, maybe run it a lot less often. It's probably. You... If there's serious performance. To... Uh, if there's serious performance concerns, I would think that uh, it might be a good idea to do OB and then and then you know and then replicate it. Like if if I was gonna if I was gonna try to absolutely maximize or absolutely optimize the the performance of it, that that might work because then 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 you're then you're shuffling it, you know, you're shuffling everything back together again. Um. um I don't know. I'm just I'm just thinking out loud. You mentioned Beehive. Which Beehive uh, disk driver are you using? NVMe, uh, VirtIO block, SATA um, emulation. On Omnius, we have the VirtIO, NVMe, and the AHCI. Um, I think that's the other option. Uh, we do not use NVMe because of disk driver issues. Um, we. I, I found some a lot more blue screens happens on NVMe than the Vert. I actually don't have any on the Vert IO. Hmm. Um, wow, but that's that the that, exact opposite experience. We, it is faster, yes. It is a lot faster, but I can't take those blue screens once every two weeks and never I'm working on projects. So, um, so you're using Vert IO? Uh, Vert IO for the most, I think, one yeah. server is using NVMe as a test okay. bed. Yep. Hmm. Interesting. Does, uh, but uh, this is on this is on SCSI? Uh or it only has the Verdeo Verdeo and Verdeo Viona, I think, or the that's networking, sorry. Uh yeah, it's just Verdeo is the disk. They don't have different options for the Verdeo. So I'm pretty sure it's using Verdeo SCSI, not Verdeo block. Oh, okay. the, the default would be Vidio block, Vidio SCSI would be the unusual fancy one. That's just with the driver's name, uh, Jan. I'm pretty sure it's just called Verdeo SCSI. In, in the actually the configs, we just specify Vertio. It's completely different, where oh, basically Vertio block is uh, each virtual PCI device is its individual block device. Vertio SCSI is a virtual HBA, and you're actually talking SCSI to the hypervisor yep. and can have mm -hmm. dozens of virtual disks uh, per uh, virtual uh, PCI device and can therefore even support hot plugging easily without having to do PCI hot plugging and unplugging. Okay. Um, uh, how large uh, disk images are you talking about, or ZVOLs or otherwise? Uh, they can range anywhere from 50 gigabytes to about four terabytes. Uh, this okay. one in particular is two terabytes in size. Um, okay. And it's uh, the only uh, VM on its array. So it's a triple mirror ZFS array. Um, I can't recall exactly what kind of hard disk they are at the moment, but they're okay. spinning rust. 
I asked because Daniel mentioned a send where if you could optimize it and then kind of send it to kind of reconstitute it. But for so, so after hours, run run the optimization basically is what you're saying, and then do a ZFS send to another data set, change the beehive but, thing to boot off the different data I'll set. Let Daniel answer that. Is that what you said, Daniel? Roughly? Yeah, because I, I mean, I've, I've done that for like, you know, let's say I add some disks and I want to get them striped across the next, uh, the next mirror or something. I've, I've done that to speed, to speed things up, to get the, um, you know, I, I mean, that's if you're, if you're trying to squeeze every last drop of performance out of it. Well, yeah. see, the thing is, I it wasn't really the issue. It was eating up all the RAM and ever had it enabled. So maybe it was trying to read something that, because RAM on the host or the VM or both? On the, on the VM. And so as soon as I turned off, the, as soon as I canceled the disk defragmented, this defragmenting task it was at 42 percent trimming through and it wasn't going anywhere anytime soon okay. um it uh it killed it dropped the ram from 56 gigs down to 20 gigs okay interesting can you run the virtual machine with less ram and see that it still works as expected because it could be that all what you that you're seeing in the guest is that the file system now caches uses otherwise unutilized guest memory as a cache because it rewrote the data and so it's still cached, whereas otherwise it wouldn't have a warm cache, uh, but the cache hit rate isn't high because it's caching cold data, but it's just still there from writing it. So it could be totally harmless uh, from what I'm mm. understanding. Uh, the, the problem is, is giving... it's competing. It's competing with some very larger ports. They're trying to run because they're mig We had just migrated to this 2022 MSS. Uh, sorry, Windows Server. Uh, in order to up upgrade them, they needed to upgrade all their databases. They've been running in 2008. It, so, it, it, but go ahead. So this is actually evicting otherwise useful data from the guest memory. So you think that reducing the amount of memory on the server will help? No, what I'm thinking is that if there's a background service in Windows which reads in the files and writes them out again, it will kind of cause the file system to cache this. And if there is no memory pressure, this data will stay around and it will look wow. like, oh, suddenly memory utilization is higher. But unless you are actually running enough big services like MSSQL, which really uh, need that memory for something else and their data gets evicted to disk, then you may just see uh, implementation artifact, which isn't harmful. And if that's not the case, then you have a real problem. And in that case, you may be, if you have business hours where you can just run the optimization service in the background, uh, overnight or on the weekends to defrag the disk and or the file system of the disk, then yeah. So maybe possibly it's not triggering the, the other, cleanup, is what you're saying? Disabling the uh, the service during right. business hours so that you accumulate the fragmentation and then uh, defrag the files uh, out of business hours if it can be done incrementally or if it e easily finishes overnight, then that also doesn't pro uh, produce an operational problem. It's just a bit ugly. And the other option I can see, the problem with just sending the data set around is that even locally sending four terabytes uh, around is so much downtime uh, that you probably don't want it the virtual machine, especially if it's a database server, down long enough to stand and receive four terabytes, uh, even if it's only over a pipe. Normally, that's the and case. But this the is one machine. rare case where I get the permission to do a lot where I where I can on this one. So this is hmm. the one rare case. But normally, I, I agree with that statement. <laughs> so, Jan, yeah. just to be clear on your point, um, you're thinking that if you had less memory, it would kind of trigger more aggressive cleanup of memory rather than just let those yeah. write cache and sit around. What I mean is if you, if he is anything like me and I had a lot of a big machine, yeah. a new machine and a memory to spare, I would just be very 
uh, generous in my memory allocations and maybe worry if it suddenly gets utilized, even if it doesn't reduce performance because it's just memory which is otherwise statically allocated to that virtual machine and goes unused. Okay. So, um, I don't know if you're oversubscribing memory, then of course that is a problem. Or if you can configure that Windows service uh, to be smart about not keeping the content cached or something. If you can do, I don't know, the Windows equivalent of direct IO so that mm -hmm. it doesn't go through the cache. In that case, I'm wondering why aren't they doing that by default? Okay. Um, Mark, does that help? Does it give you something to try? Yep, I'll definitely. And the other question would be, uh, what's the what are the caching properties of the Z volts you're passing through? Uh, we because have a 120 gigabyte SSD uh, SAS disk. I can't recall the exact details of it, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's not Zill, but it's definitely got the um, uh, sort of mm -hmm. the, the L L2 arc stored, I think is sort of so, the right word. Yep. But so if you are, are you experiencing actual uh, performance problems your, or is this, I'm seeing utilization and I'm worrying about if this is going to become a problem in the future. The client is seeing this utilization while they're running this very large uh, indexing on the MS SQL database. So it is a bit of mm -hmm. both of performance because they're running this large thing, this memory pressure not freeing up because of this task. And um, yeah, so I mean, it's kind of both like a local column A, a local column B in this one because they're they're running a large task. I, I'm not I'm not able to run this uh, indexing task myself because they haven't given me the exact command they're running. Um, because, and I've asked. Go ahead. To me, this sounds a lot like the common question is why is Linux using all of my RAM uh, for mm -hmm. Windows users coming to Linux and the, and then you're having to explain to them that unused RAM is wasted RAM and that you want a smart mm. operating system to use, to use all the unused, otherwise unused RAM as a cache instead of leaving it truly unallocated yep. and they were wasting it. Yep, 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 all true. So Mark, but you've got the other to question, try. I am familiar with that side, so I, I is know the analogy about well. the primary cache uh, property of the Z vaults. Did you set it to uh, cache everything or just the metadata so that maybe you're also seeing double caching between host and guest? Uh, Andrew, what do we normally set for that? I don't know what we normally set for that. I didn't set up the, um, the caching. I don't think we specifically changed that setting. So because it, it is possible that it's doing the double caching. So normally the default value should be all, at least on FreeBSD it is. I don't know if Omnios changed it. And no, the means default that the host, as well. That, the, that means that the host caches the uh, ZVOL content in its arc and thereby by extension its L2 arc. Uh, if you set it to metadata, the host will only cache the metadata to locate and allocate and deallocate the block device uh, content. But all actual block content is uh, uncached so that every, you rely on the guest to be smart about it. I think Windows is the one um, exception where in some cases it says uh, the detect the right kind of hypervisor, it will um, disable most of its block caching and rely on the host caching. So it could be that leaving primary cache equals all uh, is the right thing to do for Windows. Uh, but it is worth checking and maybe because you can easily set and unset it, setting it to metadata and f checking if it changes the performance. Because uh, if Windows does cache the drive content, then you don't want the host to also cache that. Mm. Because that's really wasting RAM double caching your uh, disk. Yeah, that makes sense. OK, I'll, I'll look into that setting as well. Uh, one last thing to kind of move back from memory back to the disk interface itself. I do want to note that Windows thinks that it's an SSD, so it does a trim instead of an actual disk defragment, even though they're spinning rusts. 
Um, I'm pretty sure that's because of the way the, you know, Vertio is presenting the disk. And since this is ZFS with the SSD cache on it, that it sees it as a flash device. Um, so I, that I want to get back to if it's generally, I guess, maybe a good idea. To, if Windows, it doesn't know the actual underlying storage is a hard drive. Should it, should we even trust it to be able to run a disk optimization task or should we let ZFS handle where it wants to store all the bits? So if we do a ZFS scrub normally on the host, like we should probably once in a while, shouldn't that be basically the equivalent of a defragment if it needs to be moved, ZFS will move it? I can answer that question, no. A scrub is not going to move things around. It's just going to verify your checksums. And uh, speaking about dream versus defragmentation, defragmentation would be terrible for ZFS uh, in most cases, since it would fragment the real on disk location even more. Since Windows will, would copy only data it's defragmented, and ZFS would move them into different places rather than Windows actually thinks. Would Windows copy file altogether, read all file, write all file, it would defragment ZFS, but that's not what defragmenter does usually. Hmm. Same time, uh, trim should be really helpful to ZFS since it would free empty spaces uh, on disk and allow both free space on a pool, but also uh, if there are some blocks are partially used, ZFS could uh, write those, you know, clear those holes and uh, both free in space and also uh, reducing later read modify writes potentially and so on. Uh, so, so if block is free completely, uh, ZFS can see it. And if you try to then partially write it, it will be properly re- written without read. It sounds like reducing memory and then still trying to run this. And if it doesn't affect performance in the long run and explain to the user, it's basically an equivalent of probably a Linux 8 like RAM. So this, the summary of what all of we take away. Yeah. OK. Let us know I'll, what you find. I will. Might Excellent. be a couple of weeks before I get back, but um, I will. I think yeah. in some trust versions, we have if we had Knob in Web UI to control how exactly to report LANs to uh, to the to iSCSI initiators, but honestly, I don't remember which of them misbehaved. But generally, my uh, position is that we should report this as SSD where closer to that. So ours, ah, I remember VMware was trying to put caches on everything it could see as SSDs, which doesn't end up good if you try to, if you really have a hard disk pool, mechanical one. Uh, but that's probably the only exception. And at that time, uh, VMware wasn't using Prim. So these days, probably Prim yeah. still should be better and just don't use something, it as cache. Something else to watch out for is, um, that you for a database server probably as the first optimization attempt would want to match uh, the file system block size or at least the uh, database block size with the volume block size. I did that, so I made sure I made sure to make sure the Zvol match the default block size that MSSQL is going to write to the disk, so that it doesn't have to have uh, write amplification issues. Well, yes, and that's right. Also make Just sure uh... that the partition alignment of your file systems is an integer multiple of a block size. But I think Windows fixes that for you by just aligning everything to one megabyte. I just like to mention that many people make mistake of reducing wall block size too low just because whatever database they use have some like eight kilobyte blocks. ZFS wouldn't be happy about that. Just amount of metadata operation, amount of short operations would be overwhelming. and it would it, it may improve uh, some random IO, but it would completely kill sequential. So and the goal in many cases should be uh, looking towards uh, file system behavior, increasing file system block size rather than reducing ZFS block size. Yes. And if it's a very read heavy uh, application, then you may actually see a right amplification by using a big block size and maybe even a, a tail latency uh, increase. 
but you can see a vast increase of in cash utilization and uh, effective uh, read bandwidth by using big blocks and disk uh, compression. Seen it with Postgres, where using a one megabyte uh, record size on a ZFS file system. So, and as a four compression gives you a four or five X compression ratio because uh, database indices are mostly sorted strings. And that's perfect for compression. And that means that suddenly your R can maybe affordably fit your whole database, uh, <laughs> which maybe gives you such a <laughs> giant performance increase compared to the costs of the write amplification, especially on SSDs. But oh. I don't know if you can make use of this track uh, in a virtual environment where you have to go through Zvol and another file system. Set up some tests and save them for the user summit. And we will pound on all these things because all the wisdom out there is often from a decade ago. So keep it fresh. Keep it fresh. Anyway. When's the user summit? Uh, in, in last week or last or so week of October. And it's uh, right before the developer summit. And it's now on the wiki page, but it hasn't been like loudly announced as we wrap things up to make it happen. But that's on the OpenZFS wiki page at openzfs.org. So, uh, Daniel, do you want to talk about these little clone boundaries thing if quick or what you got? Yeah, I'd love to. So, okay, what you got? Uh, <laughs> So okay, so let me try to try to explain this clearly. So, you know, rather than rolling, so if you create a if you create a data set and you take a snapshot, and then you're like, oh no, I need to roll back, but but you don't roll back. You rename it, and then you clone it. That's what that's what everybody does, I think. Everybody wants to do that because you know if you if you do a rollback, then it really does get rid of everything since the snapshot. If you rename and clone, it doesn't. So, so something interesting that I found out is if uh, Michael, do you mind if I uh, type a quick example in that? In that you spot? can put it in a doc, or you can share your screen. Whatever works. I mean, this is I'll, yours. I'll put it. Yeah, I'll put it right in the doc. If I can find it. Okay. So. Okay, great. So, all right. So we make a we make a data set. All right, and then we take a snapshot. And I'll call it snapshot A. So let's say this is at 12 o'clock. And then at 1 o'clock, I'm like, oh, no, I made a terrible mistake. Rename DS to DS backup. And then we clone DS, and then we clone DS backup back to DS. So now, so now DS backup has A and DS doesn't. DS is just a clone of, um, so DS is a clone of DS backup A. Okay, so then um, I make a DSB at two o'clock. I'll snapshot to DSB. Can I stop you for okay. a sec? Yeah, sure. Your clone operation doesn't have an at operator in it, so that won't work. It's not a valid ZFS clone operation. Okay, so yeah, so DS okay. is a clone of DS. A. Okay, there. Okay, great. So then at two o'clock, I do that. Now, my replication job, my backup job has this, right? Um, so on my backup server, on my backup server, I have DSA, and then I want to synchronize DSB. So I do CFS send dash I DS backup A to DSB, right? Okay, so here's the thing. Now the delta between A and B is, is just A and B, right? That should, that should work but I promise you I've tested it 75 million times and it does not, and it does not work. So if you go to, um, 
if, if you go to my examples, if you go to my examples now, I, I have a script that, that does exactly this. In order to do this operation, you have to you have to uh, create a new you have to create a new data set. Um, so the way to the way to fix this um, is to is to on the on the backup server that doesn't work. So on the backup server, I rename ds to ds clone uh, ds. Well, I'll just call it ds two. And then I can do this, dash I. Yeah, OK, that's it. So. Okay, so I can't, so I can't do ZFS. I so the delta here between A and B. So in in my in my imagination, that there's just bits, right? So the difference between this and the clone in A, that should be that should be a single delta. In fact, it's sort of proven by this. This works. It, it works every single time. I so. See. The rename operation is what caused the grief. Well, no, that I mean the the data set's the data set. If you look at the if you look at the GUIDs, but doesn't the rename operation create a new GUID? No. You sure? No. Well, hold on. <laughs> let's let's see in my. Let's see my example. So you're saying if I if I didn't rename it, then it wouldn't. I don't I don't think so. Let me. Let's I think see. the rename operation creates a new GUID. Not positive, but I think right. it does. I can adjust my I can adjust my script for that. Um, because that's uh, that's can't you, curious. Is there an easy way to get the that? GUID? ZFS get or list. Well, my, my, I mean, it's easy to test well, it in his environment. Yeah. You've got your script. You could just do a get here and there for what it's worth. We have, if you, so one of the, so there's the example output and it shows the GUIDs, but I didn't show the GUID for the, 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 um, for the, for the data set itself. Um, I don't think it changes it though. I mean, I could just, I mean, I could just rename a bunch of stuff right now because I've renamed, I mean, I've renamed replicated things a million times and kept the replication chains going with all of my backup servers. So I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the rename. I think it's the clone boundary. I just tried it, uh, renaming a data set from pool slash test to pool slash test two did not change the GUID uh, of the data set. Four yeah. So what? So I think I think what's so so you can so you can do a dash o origin a zfs receive dash o origin. Um, you know, to to a from from a from a source that's that's unbroken. You can, but but it doesn't work in reverse. If there's, so there's like a clone boundary that that but, it has to be. You have to use dash o origin to get it. I would is I would the, think that I should be able to have a backup that's DSA, B, C, D, E, F, and, and on and on without without having without it mattering that the source was ever cloned, but it but it does matter. Um, um Daniel, do you have yeah. any example where you are able to use DFS send dash I? With different uh, data sets as sources, where it ever works, maybe that's your whole issue that the um, snapshots you're sending are on diff are basically children of different data sets, and send dash i only works when the uh, no you said the lower one works. Wait. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's, but it's, but I mean, it's basically saying take the delta between that, you know, that uh, the the first, you know, the the incremental the incremental uh, snapshot and the current and the current snapshot. So I don't understand why that wouldn't why I wouldn't be able to tack that on top of a of a backup that also that already has a. Um, so I mean I guess I guess this is a little bit this is a little bit in the weeds. The interesting thing is I what I wanted to do was have a script that could recover that could keep a backup going after you know, after the, in, in the very common situation where you have a, where you have a snapshot on a source and then you have to roll back, like, like something crashed, I had to roll back to this morning or something like that. Yeah, that sounds then, similar to an NFS uh, handle where you have to put a neat, busy a file system ID, an inode number and a generation counter. And what you're trying to recreate here is the generation counter. So that you can reuse the inode number, or in this case, the uh, data set name in the pool. Yeah. Uh, the ugly way I would think you could do it is by recreating empty data sets in a parallel tree structure so that you would have basically the generation counters as uh, unmountable parents over the um, so you would have a ZFS data set tree uh, where you have basically the replication source and then a level of unmountable data sets for, for the generations whenever you had to break something and then you recreate the structure and then you have the data set and another one, two, three, four, five, and so on, just numbers because there is no meaningful identifier, maybe a timestamp you could use as the name. And then you uh, just create the parent data sets empty and recreate the tree structure so that the inheritance of uh, mount points and so on works. So hmm. the others to uh, basically put can mount equals off in uh, on all but the latest and then uh, you should be good to go but yeah yeah i guess i guess the the discovery or whatever my 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 personal discovery here is if you if you clone a source source replica you must clone the backup replica that's the that's the interesting thing because i don't think that that's necessarily that's necessarily intuitive because the chain of snapshots is unbroken. Uh, I, you know, this could be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and it could clone at any point. The delta between any two any, any two data sets, I would imagine, are the same. But there's this there's this clone boundary thing that that I mean, dash capital R, ZFS send dash capital R seems to deal with stuff like that. But um, but yeah, that's that's just that seems to be a fact, and I I guess. I guess if I have a question for the audience is is that is that true? If you if you clone if you rename and clone or or if you just clone you don't you don't even rename if you clone a, a source database you must clone its replica because from every single one of my tests that seems to be the case. You have to clone on the backup destination and then send to that clone. Or can you uh, replicate the cloning? You well, if you look at my uh, my on my backup server, the final line there, SSH source, then do a ZFS send with uh, the with the incremental send, and then specify the origin to the to the um, to the original. It'll create a clone called uh, in in the, in the case of my example called DS again. So now um, we have parity between the names. So now from now on, when we replicate uh, uh, changes, new snapshots or bookmarks from, uh, you know, from from the origin, from the mm -hmm. from the uh, source, uh, then then we bring them back to the backup server at, uh, you know, at the same named data set again. So, hmm. yeah, it's not it's not terrible. It's I, just it's just I think that. 
I think a lot of people, a lot of people trying to keep their backups in sync. I mean, I think what happens is we do a rollback or we do a clone and a rename and clone. And then there's a lot of fiddling with before we get our backups back running again. I'm trying to find the, the, the least amount of space and the least amount of effort to, to do that job. And I think I, I have some good, good examples of how to do that in my scripts. And it's just, I don't want to say something as fact that isn't fact, but it does seem to be that when a rename and clone or when, it, when a clone occurs on a source data set, a clone must also occur on the backup. Hmm. Oh. I wonder if it, Given how fancy your Zelda replication scripts are, I wonder if it makes sense to flatten the tree down to basically and on the backup server, just have a source and then the GUID of the uh, source uh, as name. <laughs> right. So that, that would you be... don't have any tree structure there at all and just basically st store out of band the uh, the tree mapping from GUID back to a uh, source name. Well, then I could so I could have it uh, <laughs> I could have it work universally without the ZFS backend storage in that case, because it would be uh, everything would be really predictable from the source. Um, yeah, that's that's an, that's an interesting uh, the that's an interesting way to that do you it. Can't easily without doing it manually. Uh, no, but what you could then do is have a little shell script or arc in your case, which would build up that tree and then do a mount with an O mount point so that you have a per mount mount point property uh, so that you could on the backup uh, destination uh, mount it in the correct order of the file systems in some subtree if you really wanted to basically take this tree or the, the tree as it is as of the snapshots point of view and then you could have it somewhere under slash mnt mount this snapshot set in the, in the right hierarchy but you can would lose the ability to easily infer the uh, mount tree from the zfs tree property if you flattened it but you also get rid of all the dependencies between parent and child yeah, right. And... Interesting. Well, my my personal goal is just to take the take anyone's absolutely chaotic uh you know ZFS structure and make it relatively easy to get stuff backed up. But but that is a that is an interesting way to standardize everything for sure. You if that's your goal. You might actually want to go dive in and find out how ZFS send dash capital R works. What it does right. special because it does it does do some very special things. Yeah, and yeah, it definitely follows. Yeah, it, it seems to. I mean, I think that when when I was when I was testing, I think what what it's doing is it is it is following clone boundaries. So it's it's replicating that as a as a sort of a magic hidden object that I can't touch. Because it doesn't have a GUID attached to it, and it's not exactly the same as, you know, going from A to B on the same data set. Hmm. Uh, going from A to B on a clone, there's like this imaginary, uh, this, this imaginary boundary. Um, so you're so we're not imaginary, that uh, invisible CFS boundary. Then dash R has some userland glue magic, which or glue code, which work for one case but not the other and you would have to come up with an equivalent wrapper which may only be possible at the libcfs level yeah i think for now right i think for now i can just assert that this is this is the way life is but it, this is it's it's been hard for me to, to to find an answer to this question because it's just at this point it's now you know uh it's hard to find a lot of people that do exactly this. I mean, I guess Andrew does, but. Um... It would help if you could share the filtered zpool history uh, instead of the approximate commands. Uh... Because I'm not totally sure that uh, I 
we have, have all the same interpretation of your shorthand notes. Oh, up above here? Yeah, that shorthand form is not, I'm not sure that. Oh, uh, well, you can, I, I have I added a, uh, there's a, there's a script, Jan, day. if you want to look at, if you want to look exactly what's going on, you can look at the, you can look at the script. Okay. It's all local. And it has a, there's a pool called A pool and a pool yep. called B people. So, oh, that's so, the script. Yeah, yeah so that should explain. Thing. And then there's also a an output of what it looks like an example. Obviously, the GUIDs change every time I run it. Um, of course. And watch out, because that's destructive. <laughs> well, you're asking the right question. It only messes with the two test pools. That's fine. You could just create a test pool in a 10 gigabyte sparse file. So, yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly what I'm doing. Does that give you more informed questions for say Ottawa? Yeah, I guess I, I just I just I'm I was looking at my talk that I did a couple of weeks ago and um there's there's nothing so factually wrong that it it's like embarrassing and I need to like you know send a retraction, but there are a few there are a few places where I use like the wrong term or something. So I don't want to assert that this is the case if it's not the case. Um, it'll probably be exactly three seconds of my talk that this is that this could be a, a you know one of the one of the many interesting complications of of doing backups with CFS. But that's all. You're forgiven in advance. Ah, oh, thanks. So. Uh, Rod gave a great rundown on all the congestion window sizing goodies he's been talking about for months on yesterday's call. So check out the jail zone call from this uh, date. And uh, thank you, Rod, for syntax on how to sniff for that. And then here are some same defaults, but it sounds like, Rod, you're building in the back of your head, if you're still on the call, a a table of different uh, uh, buffer sizes for say across the data center, across the city, across the country, across the world, and that's that's centralizing. Yeah, <laughs> basically, there's it's not it's pretty easy to calculate and stuff. What you need to set these parameters to based upon what a majority of your of your transfers are going to, what the delay on those paths are like, and like these these. Four mag numbers work pretty good for gigabit type connectivity up to about, I think it's 18 or 18 to 22 milliseconds, something like that. Okay. If you're, if you're transferring high volumes of data at, with gigabit connectivity at greater than 20 some odd milliseconds, even the four mag numbers, I'm, advocating here are not big enough and i can produce it pretty easy to produce a table that would give you whether you're connected it um depending upon your connection speed and what your round trip latency is what kind of window sizes you need to be setting and that's what these these three numbers all affect the tcp window size um my goal really is to try and get the developers of the various operating systems to adjust the current defaults because the current defaults have aged. I mean, gigabit connectivity to the home is something new in the last couple of years. And these numbers do not correct for that fact. These numbers are too small. Or the these numbers do correct for that fact. The numbers that operating systems are currently shipping with do not. Other than I think and, Windows 10 is actually on par with current technology. Uh, Greg, you unmuted. Do you have a question? No, I was just going to say this is of high interest to me, Rod. So I look forward to anything that you have to say. I, uh, based on your conversation or input, Last time I was speaking about this, I went and researched it more, and I 
ran across the same comment about uh, these these numbers have been in place for a couple decades and they're they, they need to be uh, relooked at they they have actually i mean they've been in place yes for actually for four decades um and they have been adjusted a couple of times over those four decades and we're coming to another point of uh, FreeBSD definitely needs to adjust its numbers. I think some of the Linux distros are a little bit closer. Like, and like I said, I think Windows Windows 10 has already done it. They've already adjusted their numbers. Um, and it, it's it's user experience. I mean, it's people go out and they get gigabit internet, somebody's Fios or, or GPON or something and stuff, and they go, God, I can't do more than 250 megabits a second on this thing. What's going on? Why can't I get it, and the other thing that goes on is is a lot of the speed tests defeat this congestion window problem by running four four tests in parallel and going, okay, yeah, your bandwidth is really this. Well, th that doesn't work for a single transfer. If you're trying to download something, you don't you don't get to do four streams in parallel. So we need to adjust these numbers. Now, some of the server guys might gripe because now we're going to be able to suck on their servers harder. Um well, if they have a complaint with that, they can put a limit on their side. Well, actually, it's very easy for them to limit it on their side by decreasing their SIN buffer. Absolutely. I'm if just saying. Just, if, if, yeah, if they just make SIN buff max 2 meg, yeah. they, depending on, unless you're really close to them, you won't get more than about 50 or 60 megabits a second. I mean, <laughs> you if they have, have a problem with that. Or anything. You don't have to use any traffic shapers, nothing. It just works. So, yeah. But even if they want to use traffic shippers, whatever, that's a them problem that they can go fix. Yes. Yes. I would I would like the experience on at least mainstream Linux and FreeBSD out of the box to be that we can use gigabit connectivity at least transcontinental, which means, I mean, coast to coast in the U.S., coast to coast in Europe, Africa, maybe not, because <laughs> that's their round trip latency is a little bit worse. They got they got some problems, and and, it's actually, gig, and gigabit sorry. connectivity is isn't prevalent there. Um, I was gonna say it's actually worse than you than than you're saying because I mean you're saying gigabit connectivity. I can get two point five where I live. Okay, yes, all right. I wasn't aware of that. You can get two point five gig to the home. Yes. Yeah, I have 1.5 gigs, and I don't even know why that's an offer. And it's, I, I, I can't. None of my devices go uh, go 1.5 or, or higher. But I guess there is 2.5 out for uh, home stuff now, though. Yep. A lot of gaming. Yeah. A lot of gaming main boards have 2.5 yeah. on them now. Yeah. True. But true. yeah, um, my my local ISP that I just a couple weeks ago had installed fiber. I'm not I'm not paying them for that much, but they are willing to give me up to 2.5 if I ask them. And that's without me badgering them. If I badgered them and really threw money at them, I bet I could convince them to go to 10. Yeah, a friend yeah. of mine is lucky enough to get 25 gig in Zurich at home. Wow. And the problem is that his... Uh, Old gaming desktop doesn't have enough single-threaded CPU throughput to act as home router uh, for that. <laughs> it's just, oh, I'm CPU bound on the two cores handling this flow. I, I, <laughs> I need to revise my research because I did. I just went and looked at the latest GPON stuff. And in fact, you can get to it. It's part of the GPON standard. You can get two and a half gig down and 1.25 up. Yeah, I that's... didn't realize they had pushed it up that high. No, it's... no I'm not. Uh, yeah. It's crazy that 25 gigs is a thing. I, uh, I don't think I've ever pushed more than 500, you know, coming down to my house. So. Uh, <laughs> I only got the 1.5 because it was on on sale as a promo for two years. I locked in the price. So. You, you probably haven't got above the 500 megabits per second because of this this uh, window size. The in flight's not big enough. Yep, yeah, fair. Um, I did. I did mess around with that, though. But yeah. Yeah, but re realize how big the numbers get. I'm I'm dealing with with transoceanic links. You're up to the U.S. at, at 170 milliseconds. 
you have to use it you have to get at least 16 and a half megabytes in fly to even get to 850 megabits a second at that round strip time that is such a huge number from when i entered into this field 16 <laughs> megabytes in flight that's crazy yeah, and, uh, yeah. I, when i first got when i realized how big the number was going to go i was like oh my god mm -hmm. and i i was actually trying to get to a gigabit but my problem is is my uh connectivity in the u.s data center is four parallel gig lengths so i can't actually get above a gigabit and you because there's a lot of traffic on those gigabit links i can't actually get above about 870 was about the best i could do and then i, I started looking i was impacting other traffic so i had to back off rod if you're really insane and want uh, your provider to hate you you can try to run multi-link ppp over pppoe uh to basically fragment each packet uh, at the PPP encapsulation layer and then share the load so that you can have a single TCP uh, connection utilize the bandwidth of multiple links, but it only works. I would, I would have to have a server. Have... I would, I would have to have a server somewhere for the other end of that MPP link yes. that was at 10 gigabit, and I don't have one in the US. It, it, if I had one in the U.S. at 10 gigabits, I'd be using that to do the testing. I, just, I wouldn't bother with the four-link node, but I just, um, we don't have the money to buy a 10 gigabit HE connection in Fremont, so. So, yeah, the other thing to try would be to set up equal cost multipath routing and use multiple interface routes, but, but uh, I don't that won't, know. You don't want that going on because that's that you're going to get out of order packet delivery and you're never going exactly. to get a real speed test. Exactly. You would need something to reorder the uh, yeah, packets. Yeah, that's just no, not not going to try that. I'm, <laughs> I'm actually dealing with a new IPv6 called Lion P that actually has a horrific reordering scenario in it. Yeah. Uh, you don't or put the FreeBSD lag driver in round robin mode, and that would also create the out of order packets. Ba basically, this protocol, as the current prototype code is implemented, does exactly that. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing as as lag in round robin. Okay, hmm. that's why I'm there. I, if I remember I've got correctly, to... there are some. Uh, kind of load sharing field of the layer two VPNs to handle stuff like this, like even asymmetric use cases where you get terrible upstream via uh, cable and better downstream via cable. So that you basically a VPN, which then does some kind of encapsulation, but that also requires an agent on both sides. And most of those are more written with DSL in mind than fiber. Yeah. So they often uh, just expose a ton interface and you would run into the next uh, bottleneck there. And I don't know of any example of that, which I would consider production ready. It's just a neat hack. So a few people discovered independently and prototyped to have cool. a single stream acceleration VPN. Well, we've covered a lot of ground in an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, Andrew, you had an offhand comment that, yeah, it's kind of funny. Proxmox doesn't have, say, in the GUI disk replacement. So um, anything else or shall we wrap it up? I think we've I can confirm that in Proxmox, yes. the, the command line Z pool command stuff works just fine for dealing with Oh, yes, that's device. what I just, well, Yeah, I just, so. I just had to do one on mine. I, I yeah. lost one of my mirror drives. Went belly up. But it's, it's just, it seems that kind of one of their, you know, big things is being, is having this nice, pretty web interface and mm -hmm. it doesn't do stuff that's absolutely essential. Yeah, but it's, they're, they're new to ZFS. You got to remember that enough to be done, dangerous. I think two, two releases where ZFS was officially supported in the installer. Okay, I mean, I'm I, I'm new three. to Proxmox, so 
you know, yeah. their, their status of ZFS support is not something that I'm super cognizant of. Yeah, they're, so they're I just fairly... stepped into this, saw this, and was like, huh, yeah. that's interesting. They're, they are new to the ZFS game. They're just not really experienced yep. there yet. Speaking of which, I'll leave with this. I had a quick poll yesterday on the Fediverse of like, hey, ballpark, what percentage of Linux users are using ZFS? And the guess is single digit at best. And we do have Proxmox and TrueNAS for helping that. But uh, yeah, whenever I hear Linux advocacy, I'd love to hear it in parallel with ZFS advocacy because those are very uh, different things. But uh, I think it's I think it's bigger than that. Really? What metrics? Thing. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I mean, it, uh, I was actually real surprised. NetDef, I never even said anything to to um, them or stuff, and they just started. They adopted ZFS about four years ago. Cool. You know, and just and they use it for their archival data storage. They've got I don't know, 50, 50 some odd. It's not ma massive. It's fifty or sixty terabyte pool that's used for archiving CI artifacts. Cool. Um, um, I have a question, and that is uh, for my previously jail tinkering. I'm doing with the the following with ZFS. I create a new data set for a template of a FreeBSD based system. Then I create a read only clone so that the clone can never accumulate and lock away modification because it's read only. I only allow the clone to be uh, mounted writable to create empty directories for mount points. So that essentially state I can easily recreate then to install packages on that, I clone a base system, create new file systems, keep only the new file systems writable, install the packages uh, in the directories which are now mountable, then snapshot that and make everything read only. And then I instantiate by cloning the base system from the base system uh, jail file systems and the um, Packages get cloned from the package template so that I don't have even the problem that I build up this layering like uh, Linux containers with OCI uh, image overlays would. So I flatten that, clone it together, and uh, mount it. But that's a lot of ZFS command invocations, which potentially happen on every uh, jail start. Um, so that's like, 100, 200 milliseconds uh, to do. And I was looking at doing it in C directly with libzfs, but libzfs isn't really documented to write custom code against it. Um, is there any documentation which I've overlooked and which would help other than just reading the ZFS command uh, implementation? to learn how to use libzfs to do this logic in C in my own helper command. To Because with, it looks like I should be able to get it down from 150 milliseconds to 10 or so by doing that. Does Solaris, does the Sun Oracle site um, ZFS documentation have any documentation on libzfs? Not that um, I've discovered. Okay. I'll have to look around to see if I can come up with anything. Um, the caveat is, with that is, my understanding is libzfs was always an uncommitted or a, a unstable interface. You know, using the Sun definitions of stability, which is, you know, we don't don't depend on this to stay the same between versions. So. I don't I would, know how good the documentation for it is. I would only care if they broke the API compatibility in major ways between releases and not if, oh, you have to recompile this to, uh, to the latest ABI to work because this is a command on the host managing the jail. So it's easy for the command to stay in sync with the host version. Yeah, I mean, well, 
the sun's definition of, of a stable interface is one where they are not going to change the ABI. And that, at least that's what it used ways. to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I know when there was that guarantee is when they started to get, is when they would get super serious about things. Yep. Like, like that. Um, and not just using it as an, as an internal kind of thing. I don't uh, demand that level of stability from the API or the ABI. Yeah, I get it. I'm just kind of giving maybe some of the historical context. Sure. And it's busy. Yeah, this what it is. I will look around and see if I can find any docs for it, because um, it would probably I'm be spread interested. across different man pages. And on our side, everything is usually man pages. On the FreeBSD side, libzfs functions do not have man pages. They may and not either. I haven't looked for them, so I, I won't know until I do. I'm mostly interested in the 10,000 foot view of how to um, geometrically use this library and this API of this is how you're supposed to design around it and not what does this specific function do. More like I don't want to end up trapped in a specific uh, problematic uh, usage of the API fighting against it and then having a terrible time. Well, unfortunately, if I were to find anything, I would expect to be more along the lines of this is what this function does. That's also an improvement over what's written in the header. Because that's most of the because that's that and the ZFS command is what I've been using so far. And mm -hmm. it got me to uh, listing file systems and so on. And another question I, I have, which I don't have an answer to is, which would also solve this problem for me is if I could use uh, ZFS channel programs to create uh, clones, not just snapshots. Because it looks like the everything I could find is that the ZFS programs man page specifies the API available to the Lua code, but I can take new snapshots, but I can't uh, create new clones from inside a channel program or empty file systems even. Uh, well, is that, that intentional? Like hefty oversight. Is that intentional uh, that there's, there's a good reason why this isn't possible from inside? Because then it would become a lot simpler for me because if I could do basically all the cloning, creating unmountable empty file systems um, and creating new empty file systems uh, atomically I, in a channel program, I wouldn't have to do the intermediate steps to make sure that I'm always in a recoverable state so that an item potent uh, script can run again and finish the job if it fails midway. Uh, because when, when if it's all atomic, then yeah, it would be so much easier and nicer for the user because certain error cases are not visible. It's either completely done or not done at all. So yeah, yeah let's let's I mean posing that to the open ZFS dev is a, is should probably be done because that's a fantastic question. Because what I want to do, what I would wish to be able to do with a channel program is to find the right snapshots in the in the uh, different uh, subtrees of a common parent, I want to then clone from those or create new empty parents so that I have somewhere to clone it. Compute this in a Lua script. It's right now it's like 300 lines of shell, which is approaching the upper limit of what you should do in a sh single shell script. In Lua, where you have uh, real arrays and objects which are hash tables 
means it would be a lot shorter and less error prone than compute this and then do all of that inside one uh, write transaction that would be really helpful. But it looks like the API does not exist and I don't know if that's, I'm the first one crazy enough to ask for it or if there's a major architectural reason why it's not feasible or at least not easy to do. But if it was possible, it would be really helpful because it would reduce the startup time a lot and uh, the, at least even for a fresh jail, which has never been started. And the, it would be impossible for anyone to ever observe uh, inconsistent states. And I don't care about atomically mounting the file system. That is easy to solve. But if it's also possible to just mount them in the right order, because yeah, it would also be useful. Don't make me tap the minutes, which I said we're looking for a big old report on this. Oh, fortunately, Antonig was on the hook for that report. So yes, uh, I very much, uh, did I say blog? Yeah, like blog posts, please. All your nifty. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. There you go. It's in multiple languages. Come on. So and let's see I'm the code. Cleaning up the code so that <laughs> it's usable. Awesome. I look forward to that. For other users, because right now it's uh, yeah bus factor oh. of one point uh, nine or something. Uh, or sorry, zero point nine. So yeah, I may have forgotten ten yep. percent. Goodness. Anything else, gang? I am good. I say we call it. Thank you all. Like and subscribe, and we'll talk to you <laughs> perhaps tomorrow or next week. You guys have a good day. Take care. See you all. Bye-bye.